everyone, and welcome to Inside Leather History, a fireside chat. I'm Doug O'Keefe. I am the host and the producer of the chats, which are a program of the Leather Archives and Museum. Today, I'm at the iconic Ramrod Bar in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Actually, Wilton Matters. And my guest today is Chad Bush. Chad is the general manager of the Ramrod and the producer of Pig Week. Hey, Chad, how are you? I'm very well, man. How are you? I'm great. Good. We share a really fascinating history that we discovered when we were preparing for this interview. We literally came out and attended the same bar in Akron, Ohio, right. in the 1980s. Now, I could not believe the overlap that we shared yeah. in that situation. Tell us a little bit about Jock's Bar in Akron. Is it even still there? No, the front door is still there. Um, but most of what's happened in Akron, especially in that part of town, um, is kind of gone, because that was right across the street from the Firestone plant where they made the tires. When that closed down, that whole section of that city kind of shut down as well. So, um, yeah, the uh, the bar there, Jock's, was amazing. It was actually one of the first bars that I had ever worked in. Uh, and I was a DJ there when I was a teenager. And I was old enough to get into the bar. But um, I was dating a bartender. So that, that, that totally, yeah, that totally made that work. And, um, and it was great. I really loved that place. And um, it's just, it's, still to this day, I think about it very fondly. Yeah. yeah. I was 20 years old and I came out and that was the first bar I ever visited. So it's always going to have that little bit of right. nostalgia for me. Right. But additionally, you were part of the gay group at Kent State University. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that was the KGLF, and I was the president of the KGLF back in... I... A long time ago. And, uh... <laughs> so, uh, uh, And it was, it was a great experience. And that was right when... That was right at the... Um, Right, when we were getting active for, with HIV culture and being able to be proactive in teaching you know, uh, teaching uh, people to get tested and teaching people about safe sex and it was that whole period, which was, you know, to be on the forefront of that when you're 18 years old, yeah, you know, was yeah. quite daunting. We set up a, uh, a, a HIV hotline for people to be able to call in and ask questions that they didn't know and we had support groups and we had testing and um, we did a lot of social things as well. But it was a it was really a, it was a great time and you know to, um, to be able to get active and um, be able to help serve the community. You, know? you said Akron was a gay place in the eighties. What did you mean by that? Well, you know Akron um, is you know right outside of Cleveland, right above Canton, kind of like the, the mid city and the tri city area. And we also had Akron U, which was a huge amount of young people and a lot of young gay men mm. and um, and women. And so the amount of bars that we had, we had seven, eight bars at any given time, and very large bars, you know, like Quest, which was one of the bars yeah. we both went to, yeah. um, that was upwards of 30,000 square feet and just, it's a massive complex. And we also had the Interbell, which was another giant club and jocks where you know we were, we were both had at the same time yeah and um, all of those were just massive and full yeah you know, yeah and quite full and then you know and you know cleveland had its own community but we had such a huge amount of people going to the bars going out at that point it was before internet yes well <laughs> so, and what i remember too from a lot of that was we had fantastic music we did at that time yeah, <laughs> totally different from anything we know now, 30 some odd years later. Right. <laughs> so, tell me a little bit more about the work at Kent State with uh, the gay group there. You mentioned that you did a lot of work with like HIV and AIDS education, but you had a wonderful meeting that also went on, wasn't it, every month? Every month, yes, yeah. Uh, every month we would do the social, and mm -hmm. um, that was where people came in from from all over to to come to our to come to our our, our big mixer social. It was a non um, it was a non HIV event. It was just to have fun. It wasn't yeah. us. We weren't protesting anything. We weren't 
um, getting, yeah. you know, pushing for people to get tested. It was just for us to have fun together, and um, it was really great. And that was one of that was it was a huge event. We had tons of people come to it, and it was very popular. And yeah. actually, yeah, it was the when I first got there, it was the Kent Gay Liberation Front, and now and then during that my, my tenure there, it was the Kent Gay Lesbian Foundation. I mean, there's a lot more initials to put behind that now if it was going to stick that way. But, um, yeah, it's, uh, that was, that was kind of that, the, the, the beginning of that change. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yeah, it, it was an amazing time. It really was. Do you ever keep up with it? Do you know if it's still in operation? Um, I did see, I did see on, online that, you know, it was, it was in some fashion still going. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. That's fantastic. Yeah. But Kent State's a big enough school that it can support that. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So, what happened uh, after Akron? What did you do? Well, after Akron, um, well, I went to Kent State, and then I transferred to Italy for a uh, period of time, and, um, and then to uh, uh, Paris, and um, then I went to N I went to NYU after oh, okay. after that, okay. um, just because it was part of the American Institute, and all my credits were transfer. <laughs> you know, so it was a great way to graduate from us. Better than, at school better than Kent State without having to lose all my credits. So, um, moved to Manhattan for quite a while, and um, there, still involved in the clubs and still being, well, a club kid. I, my, my first couple of jobs were, I was at a place called the Pyramid with, uh, I was a American Indian in a play where a drag queen dressed as Christopher Columbus had bought the island of Manhattan for a bunch of beads <laughs> to give it to the Indians, and I was one of the Indians. It was it was quite quite funny to have that be your first job. But then you know, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> but when I came over, I had all this amazing music, and back then it was called Acid House, and um, I brought it with me from uh, from Europe, and okay. so I uh, became a DJ and. Kind of kept doing that throughout the entire time being in New York, and then being a club kid, they started shipping us down here to open up, you know, the clubs in Miami. And then, you know, I mean, then I got fat and hairy. They made one-way ticket to Fort Lauderdale, and said, "Don't come back." No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> but let's take, let's take a step back. Tell me, what were you doing though in France and in Italy? Oh, I was studying. Yeah, okay. yeah. Uh, it was uh, start, uh, art history and sculpture, and um, and it was a great time. Uh, I learned a lot. Loved being over there, but um, you know, coming back to coming back to the states, I was relieved actually. <laughs> After I got back, I was gradually coming back to New York City, and it's like that was like the jumping off point for you know the rest of my life. You know what I mean? That was all play over there. Going to college, okay. You know what I mean? Coming back to NYU and um, and getting back into the bar scene, and my life really has just grown from that moment. I was promoting there, and promoting now, <laughs> you know, so. But take us back another step. You said you got involved in, in the club scene in New York. How did that happen, and what did you do? Oh, gosh. All right, so my first job, <laughs> well, besides the, uh, the the one with uh, Matt Pyramid, I worked with a guy named Chip Duckett, and uh, Chip Duckett was a promoter. And at that time, we were doing this club called... Um, bars, and it was bars need men Thursday, and I was spinning, um, I, I was spinning, I think, third floor, which was kind of like acid house, trip hop, kind of that thing going on. It was a very, it was a very cool crowd, you know, and it was a multi-layer club, and, uh, <clears throat> gosh, I think the home of Van Zandt and Rupe Hall were DJing on the roof, I mean, it was the basement. <laughs> I don't know. He got involved but in, in the life. club somewhere. In the club somewhere, okay. and then yeah, the, you know there was just the greatest DJs in the world were there. It's great, you know, and um, getting to know them and learning more about music, and um, it just became you know a passion, you know. And uh, I spun for years and years, you know. And um, but you know, like spinning, it's it, unless you want to travel, and uh, and this was like. I was a vinyl DJ because I had all this said that everything was kind of moving out of that and already in the club scene and I already started picking up ships bartending. So, um, you know, coming here to Fort Lauderdale, uh, Ramron was a perfect fit for me.
But that's a big change leaving New York City for South Florida. So what prompted that? <coughs> well, um, I was spending a lot of time down here anyway. And um, it just kind of naturally kind of evolved in this way. You know, I mean, it seemed to be right. <coughs> no, I did, I did go back to Akron for a while. And I opened up a bar called Babylon. Okay. Yeah, and I had Babylon for many years. And then bringing it, then when I sold that, came down here to Florida. But that's a big step. I mean, as again, leaving New York City and opening a bar then again in Akron, what was going on that enabled you to be able to do that? Well, um, I was actually also working for my parents. <laughs> you know, which are, when I graduated, it was time for me to, you know, kind of see what I could do, you know, here and then still going back and forth to Miami to open the clubs and spin and doing all that. And then it just became more lucrative to come down here. Okay. You know, after a while. Okay. Now, tell us a little bit about the LGBTQ, et cetera, scene here in Fort Lauderdale when you arrived. Well, um, that was in 2005 uh, when I got here. And I think it was six. I think it was five. And um, it, was, uh, it was amazing. It was great coming to a Mecca at that time. Um, the meccas were kind of shrinking, and you know, South Beach was no longer the big gay mecca that it was. That everybody was had moved into Fort Lauderdale. So, Wilton Manors, being so densely populated and with such you know amazing gay people and gay things, I mean, if you haven't been to Wilton Manors to see what we have here in this city. You'll be shocked um, if you if you've never seen anything like it because it doesn't exist in San Francisco anymore. That's true. And Palm Springs is so spread out. Yeah. You know, um, all of it's very gay ghetto centric. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's 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 a great place to live. You know, and people sometimes give it a bad rap. It's like, oh, we've got so many gay people here. You know, you could if you don't want to you don't want to hang out with that person. Hang out with the other people. <laughs> you know, I mean. But what was the biggest surprise, I guess, if it was if it was so concentrated here? Was there anything that really stood out to you that said, wow, this is definitive? Yeah, actually. Um, I remember when I, was, when I first came, I was staying um, at uh, a friend of mine's guest house right there off the drive. And um, I walked out of the guest house. It was right on Wilton Drive. And as far as I could see, were gay people. <laughs> and there's five gay bars in that complex yeah. right there. Yeah. You know, and there's all these restaurants and the food was amazing. And I, and I felt so welcome. You know what I mean? Not something I had felt since, you know, uh, uh, going to San Francisco when that was still, you know, a, a neighborhood that was, you know, uh, uh, very inclusive and isolated from the rest of the world. Um, and, and even Key West. I remember when Key West kind of uh, became yes. more of a tourist spot than a gay spot. And I remember feeling it the first time um, going down there in like the mid-80s and going, wow, this is beautiful. All these gay men and everybody's so positive, everybody's so comfortable. And, you know, it, it, it was just an amazing way to feel, you know. And i like, kind of looking for that Key West feel. My whole life, when I came here, it reminded me of that. Tell me more about Key West, because we really don't hear anything about that. Well, it's not what it was. Uh, no. It was, back then, I mean, there was gay movie theaters, and there was gay bars, and then there, you know, and that was before they opened up the big ports to the big cruise ships. Oh. So when that happened, all the tourists were coming in every hour, you know what yeah. I mean? Which yeah. kind of killed the vibe for the gay people that lived there. That Key West, Key West culture, which was amazing, you know, these people were um, lived in their own happy, beautiful, safe world, and you know, then you know, all the souvenir shops got bought, uh, got bought up, and, and well, everything was turned into a souvenir shop. Yeah, that was in the yeah. entire day strip under wall, and um, it's kind of was the beginning of the end for the gay culture there. You know, not that there's still great bars and there's still that, but it's not. Not what it used to be. Yeah. 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 
So you do, you do you feel then that Fort Lauderdale became sort of the melting pot for the people from all the different areas to congregate? I really do. And I, I know, yeah. I, I see people that I've known from Miami 30 years ago, and people I've known from QS, they're all, they're all here. I still, I still am friends with them, which is really great. And to have that history in a, in a community is yeah. what it's all about. I mean, when I go to, when I go to Publix, which is, right, Five Points, which is like the center of what matters. Supermarket. Right, Publix Supermarket, right. Um, I know all the names of the, like, the people that work the registers. I know, <laughs> I go there, I say hello to 30 people, and that I know because I, I've been here for so long. And that's yeah. what being in a community is about. Being able to go there and see your friends. And, you know, driving down the street. Yeah, it's like, oh, that's Brian and David. Oh, yeah, that's Chris. You know, I mean, it, it makes you feel good to be in a community that is this close. You know? But let's take the step back again. I, tell me more about the Fort Lauderdale that you first experienced. The sort of, sort of the kink side of Fort Lauderdale, the bear side, the leather side? Well, my first, the first thing that I started doing uh, when I got to Fort Lauderdale was setting up bear parties. And um, I had a, uh, a large uh, mailing list of, of bears at that time. And um, <clears throat> I did kind of my own like welcoming party, <laughs> you know, for myself okay. at my house, you know, kind of you know, break the house in. And um, and it was great. There was hundreds of people at it. It was and it was really a lot of fun. And um, then I started renting guest houses to do um, these bear pool parties all over. Right. Um, and from there, um, a couple things happened. I started throwing bear parties here at Ramrod, you know, as well. And um, then started doing. There was, there was pig dance, and there was man dance, and there was all these other things that were really being incorporated into our program here. And we did this, uh, we did Beach Bear starting a couple of years after that. And that was a huge hit for many years until, um, you know, I, I, I wanted to go in a different direction with Pig Week. Okay. Which, yeah, okay. so we, we moved out of that and moved into Pig Week, which was, you know, kind of the, the way that that got started. So what I'm understanding is that you have a huge uh, reservoir of people you knew from all the other work you had been doing. And as you mentioned, they all sort of congregated here. Right. Got it. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> yeah. And then what I started noticing is like being here, being part of the leather community and being a bear, a lot of my leather guys did not want to go to the bear parties because they didn't feel like they were a bear. And a lot of my bear guys that yeah. were in the leather party parties because they didn't feel that they were leather enough. Um, <clears throat> so that's why Pig seemed a way to create a new genre where everybody felt comfortable because all men are pigs. <laughs> <laughs> right? yes. And no matter if you're a, a, a jock or a body boy or a leather guy or a bear, you're welcome because it's a fetish community. It's not about what you look like. It's about what you like, you know. And the community has taken off so so well. I mean, the, there's pig events now happening all over the world, and I couldn't be prouder. Yeah. You know? But take take me back. How were you even exposed to the entire kink concept? How did you even know about this? Well, um, <clears throat> ever since I was you know first coming out, I always knew. You know what I mean? I I knew that my leather scene was something I was super interested in. I, and I always liked big masculine guys. And so, um, so when, and all the bear, uh, all the bear nights were always at leather bars. Okay. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, in Cleveland, the leather stallion, and, mm -hmm. and then at my bar in Akron, and, you know, and then down here, they were all kind of incorporated together and yet still separate. So, um, you know, being a kid, knowing that you like you know, that particular genre of men, you know, that's what you gravitate towards, you know. So, you know, that's how, that's how that started. And then, when, when Pig Week first started, I had no idea how it was going to take off. Mm -hmm. But I knew I had enough people interested, and Pig Week was, or Pig Dance was doing so well, um, that to go from having, like, a weekend event, which I was having, 
uh, for uh, Beach Bear, uh, to having a 10-day event yeah. in a new genre. Um, it took a huge marketing push. And my first my first big event that I had of that first year uh, for, the, for that first party, um, I remember, and it's... Pig Week starts right after Thanksgiving, and Thanksgiving is the most lucrative weekend in Fort Lauderdale, according to the Visitor Conventions Bureau. Because, oh. yeah, because we've got the Hurricane Showdown, okay, the White Party, all right, all the tourists for uh, for Thanksgiving, and at that time there's another LGBT conference um, in Miami as well, right? Okay. So okay. all of that was happening this same weekend, right? And we also had, at that time, the Leather Mass Ball going on. And so getting people to stay from Thanksgiving to stay in Fort Lauderdale as long as we can keep them here until the following weekend yeah. where the pig dance happens, the first Saturday of every month, okay. was kind of the, the thrust to keep those people there. And, um, and it worked beautifully, you know. And I, I, the way that people have responded and embraced uh, Pig Week and, and the events. I'm just so grateful <laughs> and so excited for this genre to have taken off like it has. How long have you been doing it? Uh, pig, well, uh, pig Week officially is our eighth year okay. of okay. doing that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I think, yeah, our eighth, yeah, it's our eighth year. <laughs> okay. Right? Because, you know, we didn't have one for 2020. Right, with COVID. Yeah. How did you navigate that? Well, it was heartbreaking, you know what I mean, yeah. to cancel, but I couldn't, in good faith, go ahead and have it. You know what I mean? I, I knew, you know, coming that, you know, coming through the summer, that first summer of it, there was no way. Because to yeah. throw an event that big, it takes a full year of planning. I couldn't even, I couldn't plan anything. We had no idea what was going to happen. We were all scared. You know? yeah, yeah. yeah. So, you know. so after things started to uh, get a little different, <laughs> you know, in, in uh, the latter part of 21, um, it's like, okay, we're ready. And people, I've forwarded everybody from the f from the first year to, or from the from 20 to 21. So I already had, you know, 800 something people already registered. Oh wow! <laughs> wow. Know? So, wow. Um, so then just moving it forward. And say, okay, we're going to do this. Everyone was like, yes, because we were right in that scene between Delta and Omicron. Yes. We didn't know yes. about Omicron yet. And Delta, and people were coming back, and the yeah. tourists were here, and everyone was flying in, just like, they were with masks, but we were still doing that. And um, being in that scene, it was so lucky, because then Omicron kind of took control, you know, which... Put another damper on them on all the tourism in Fort Lauderdale, but um, yeah, we're going strong for next year. We are. We just set up the site four days ago. We have twelve new registrations. I have to register. Now. <laughs> this is this is going to be my first pig week. Wow. And what can I anticipate? Tell me what I can anticipate coming here for that. Well, wow. you know, people ask me this a lot. They say things like, "Well, what's the best party that you have to that you know that I can't miss?" And there's so many different parties, you know. I mean, I've got parties for people with a foot fetish. I've got parties for people who like fisting. I've got parties for people who are into bondage. Um, I've got people who are uh, into rope play. And any, if there's a, if it's a, if it's a fetish, I throw a party for it. <laughs> you know? What do you do it though? Where? Well, it's actually it's the entire city. Um, it, there are 27 venues. Oh, wow. That take place in from guest houses, to uh, b and to all of the clubs, to um, restaurants, to the gym, and a warehouse, and, you know, the, the, you know all of them, everybody takes takes part in Big Week, you know, and that's kind of been the magic to it, success, you know what I mean? Because when you've got, when you've got 45 restaurants that are giving a discount for anybody with the Pig Week tags, oh, wow. you know, oh, I mean, wow. that's a really big thing, you know, so... It's, and then you've got, we have upwards, we had 87 parties last year yeah. in 10 days, right? Yeah. So, uh, it takes a lot of people 
in this city to pull it off, you know. How do you manage to coordinate that? Because in a neighborhood like this, which is still sort of subjective to the overall diversity and, and sometimes bitchiness of the community, how do you manage that? Here's how. Um, I never charge any bar or any restaurant or anything to have a party. Okay. My job is to bring money into the community. Okay. And so that's why I'm not, I don't, oh, you know, I'm not charging alibi to have a party for this or for that or ever, any of them. I just don't do it because um, it's what makes it stronger. And I've yes. learned over the years, um, when you're not charging, nobody's bitching. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. And and everybody makes money. Okay. You know? And everybody has a great time. People come here. And, I mean, it was great when I joined Barabans, but there was 100 Barabans yeah. back then. Yeah. People started coming here and like, wow, this is so different. And it's so exactly where I want to be. You know? And exa exactly what I've been looking for. You know? So, yeah, it's been... It's been quite great. Now, you, you don't charge, but how then do you finance a lot of this if you're not uh, charging the bars? Yeah, don't charge the bars. Uh, yeah, you buy, you buy a dog tag okay. right, to, uh, for a week pass. Yes. Right? Yes. And, or, or we charge at the door for people who are only going to be here for one night. Okay. You know? Okay. So, um, that really works. You know? I mean, that way, you know, the bars are... Selling booze and selling food and you know and all of that stuff and it's you know that's that's really what makes Big Week work. Yeah. Now, um, how many people normally would attend? Well, um, at on any for all the parties combined, we've had over a hundred thousand people attend parties. Just, wow! Yeah. But those are people who have it, we ch we count at every party, but there's, when there's eight parties a day and some person is going to yeah, to several to several, it, yeah. yeah, it's not a, it's not a real number. Right. You know right, what I mean? Right. But it is the number that we, we get on our clickers. Okay. You know, so, um, but yeah, it's it's a it's a mass crush of people, which is perfect. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Now, what feedback do you get from people regarding a lot of this? Well, you know, there's a lot of events um, for the letter scene, right? Mm -hmm. and, for, and for fetishes. Um, when you deal with IML, which you've been a part of, um, that's contest based. Yes. You know, and um, and vendor fair based, and it's um, and I did not want to have that feel to Pig Week. I didn't want there to be a competitive edge, okay. and I didn't want to. I didn't want it to, that to be the thrust, like the vendors fair. I didn't want that to be the thrust of what people are going to do because we have this city, yeah. which is a vendors fair. Yeah, There's yeah, all yeah. the gay shops up and down the street on both sides, and that's our vendor fair, and that's what we're promoting. You know? Now, I, I I have to wonder for Pig Week, do you, what do people normally expect from a lot of this? Is there something specific that uh, you've heard people say, this is what I want? Well, yes. The super huge sex parties, everybody likes them. <laughs> <laughs> you know, when you've got... You know, you got 700 people, you know, naked, bawling on our dance floor. It's, you know, it's, it's quite exciting. Um, but um, there's people that have really wanted to find things, especially people from Iowa or, you know, not, nothing against Iowa. Um, but there's not a big fetish community there. Right. So they look at, they look at my list and like, oh, my God, there's a foot fetish party here and a piss party there. Two things I'm really into. I'm going now. And like, thank you for doing this. I've been trying to find this. I've been looking for, you know, we get a lot of that. Um, and people are just, they're grateful to find their brothers. You yeah. know? Yeah. It's really good. Yeah. Any disappointments? Well, COVID. Well, <laughs> yeah. That was a bit of a disappointment. Um, no, the, the city supports me. The county supports me. Um, all the bar owners, you know, they're, they all take place. And, yeah, I mean, it's disappointments. No, not really. How about any parties that haven't worked out that you don't do anymore? No. Nope. Okay. Yeah, I mean, there's, I mean, we, we still have all those, all the original places we had parties at mm -hmm. in our first year, we're still doing parties there. Okay. You know. Um, What's the biggest one? The, the biggest most popular. One. 
oh, well, pig dance here, you know what I mean? But then we have the Psycho Circus, which is on Wednesday. That's huge. And that's got my Gang Bang Lottery. Uh, uh, it's got, uh, like, we launched Drummer Magazine there uh, when okay. Drummer came out uh, again. Um, we've done a lot of things, you know, at that, at that party. But it is, it's the one I get the most feedback on. Okay. And people saying that was fucking amazing. <laughs> yeah. But tell me about the gangbang lottery because that's <laughs> that's the stuff of legends, really. <laughs> All right. Well, the gangbang lottery. Um, it started out because there's a lot of different porn companies eight years ago. Yes. Yeah, when we were starting Big Week, and since they were all coming into Fort Lauderdale, and I needed hot guys, and I needed performers, and I needed this, um, the all the porn companies we got together. So we can hire in the best porn stars in the world. So we could get all the biggest names from Spain or from um, Portugal or from wherever, wherever, just to fly them in because we're all splitting the cost. Okay. Right. So it, and then they get to work for ten days because okay. they could shoot with all the different companies. You know what I mean? So it really became it's like a clearinghouse of porn stars. Okay. <laughs> Which okay. is one of the greatest things about because about Penguin because there's so many hot big name porn stars every day shooting mm -hmm. over and over and coming to the parties and hosting parties and you know and, and they've been absolutely amazing and like Ray Dalton he's he has from the beginning been one of my porn wranglers so and he's been in the industry for quite a while so and he does production he does all of those things but having him who knows everything who's doing really well right now Who's come? Who's flying into Miami? He knows all of them, so mm -hmm. it really does. It really does help, you know. And he's been amazing. Yeah. Everything that you've been telling me for the last few minutes here, it really tells me you are the common denominator of the Fort Lauderdale community. What are your feelings on? That? I don't know about that, but I mean, there's there's so many amazing people in this town. Mm -hmm. well, there really is. I mean, I could. I can name five people up on top of my head who are just really active and, you know, with all of the benefits, with all of the, you know, with all of that stuff. And, and that stuff is so important. You know, it's, I mean, my stuff happens a couple times a year. They do stuff every month. They do, you know, the people who really, really work in this community. And, you know, and I'm in awe of them. You know what I mean? But if, that's what makes a community. We're all doing our own thing and working with each other to make sure it all happens. Like, I, yes, I'm here at Ramrod. I just gave a huge gift basket to Mr. Eagle. <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Because, yes, I want our community to grow. I, I want, you know, I, mean, I just gave to another uh, benefit. I just gave, you know, a thousand dollars to another benefit. In so many communities, we see a lot of fighting. We see a lot of estrangement. You're, you're not depicting that here. Why no. do you think this scene is different? You know, this scene is different because we're not, we don't see, most of our clients are tourists. Okay. Right? So they come in, they look in the books, and they say, oh, this is happening. Or they're online, like, oh, this is happening. That's what's going to happen. You okay. know? And they're here all the time anyway. We get, you know, playing loads of people yeah. every hour, right? especially yeah. during season, all the time. And that's... There's no time for fighting when you're working. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm not. I, yeah. You know, having a party there, great. I, you know, I'll put it on my page. You know what I mean? I'll, you know, I'll, I'll send it out for you. I'll put you in my newsletter. I'll do because you know, community's great. You know, and they do the same thing for me. It's just fascinating for me as an outsider to your community here, because I see in so many other communities all this infighting, yeah. and they get all of this anger all of this nastiness going on, but here you're depicting a situation where it doesn't happen. Well, it doesn't happen with me. If okay. it happens, I don't know about it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, I mean, yeah. they might, you know, this guy might not like that guy, or they're going, they all like me. Yeah, <laughs> and I like great. all of them. That and, does you make know. you the common denominator, well, doesn't it? Also, there yeah, we did. We started a, uh, a phone loop for all of the owners, mm -hmm. and all of the people that, you know, are GMs or head security for all the different bars, people that um, so if there is a problem, mm -hmm. right, I can just, I can send it out to everyone at one time. Okay. It's like, oh, this is happening on Wilton Drive, uh, be careful, da 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 okay. da And so okay. we all kind of band together and take care of each other. 
which is important. You know? When we were preparing for this interview, you told me that a lot of very young people, or just people in general, come to Fort Lauderdale chasing dreams. Mm, now, somewhere, someone's going to see this interview and they're going to say, I want to go and I want to live in Fort Lauderdale and I want to enjoy that scene. What advice can you give that person? Don't become a cliche. Um, and stay off the drugs. <laughs> I mean, that's, I mean, I, mm -hmm. honestly, I've seen it so many times where people come into town and, you know, these bright-eyed, beautiful boys, you know, coming in, like, you know, just right off the bus, and they get into town, they're partying, they're having a great time, they get hooked up with the wrong crowd, they get on drugs, they shave their head, become a bottom. It's really, it's not, you know, it's, it's kind of, it's kind of the, the Fort Lauderdale fall down, the downward spiral. Um, and take care of yourself. They're great. You want to party, have a great time, enjoy that. But it can't be your lifestyle. You know what I mean? When you live here, you're no longer a tourist. Yeah. You know, when you live here, you got to work here. And people who move here sometimes forget that they're not a, they're not a tourist anymore. Right. They have to get a job and they have to do things and they have to, you know, all those things. And it's, I've seen so many people forget that. You know? If a young person were to walk up to you right now, what would you say to that person? Uh, let me see your ID. <laughs> 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 That's fair. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, my demographic isn't that young here. Okay. Right but, um, you know, I mean, it's the city, and I, I, I see them all the time. And um, if they were asking me life advice, um, I'd say find a good group of friends and hang out with them. Okay. You know what I mean? Okay. People that have jobs and, and, you know, not people that, you know... Um, are going to drag you in a direction you don't want to go. Okay. You know? Okay. Yeah. You did mention the drug scene. How prevalent is that here? What goes on with that here? Well, honestly, like before COVID, it, it, Crystal hit hard. It hit hard. I saw the best minds of my generation. <laughs> well, now, but, um, yeah, it was an amazing uh, turn of events in such a short period of time where Crystal really hit and people were dropping like flies and becoming crazy. I mean, just, you know, the, the insane things that people were doing. It was quite sad, you know. And like, I'd, I'd see friends at the gym, you know, and then I'd see them two months later and they've, you know, they've lost 30 pounds. They're all, you know, stabbed up and, you know, a disaster. And I, I feel bad for them, you know. Just stay out of that scene. Why do you think it's so prevalent here? Well, I th people learn. It's changed now, I think. Um, especially after COVID. Um, I haven't seen that amount of craziness back in town yet. You know what I mean? I think okay. it really, I think COVID did quell that uh, quite a bit. Um, okay. Which is good, because, you know, one good thing about COVID is people went out talking to their dealers and, you know, <laughs> you know yeah. and out doing that. It did yeah. put a kibosh on that for quite a while. So, you know. You have a son. Yes. Tell us about your son. I'll bet a lot of people don't know this. Ah, uh, yeah. All right, so, um, yes, I have a son. And his name is Sebastian. And um, he is... Uh, yeah, he's a tennis player. And um, when his father and I have been friends for a very long time, and he's from Bolivia. And um, my son is a amazing tennis player. Um, and he is, he wanted to become uh, a pro. And he, so, but first he had to get on the junior pro tour. And we had to get him out of Bolivia because it's a totalitarian state. Uh, and you can't, there's no tournaments there. And you can't bring coaches in. And you can't send money out. You could, there's a lot of things you couldn't do in Bolivia that you can do, in, especially here in South Florida. So it was best that I brought him here, you know, for okay. that, and uh, for him to go on tour, which was great. And he was, you know, uh, he was always on tour. It's not like he lived here, <laughs> you know, because he was touring his, you know, throughout all his high school years. And then okay. um, when he graduated, uh, he got into Villanova and business school, and 
of international finance. And, um, and he's, he's such a proud Baba. He's interned at Shanghai for Alibaba. He had the School of Economics. Um, wow. He's been, he picked, got picked up, he got optioned. He had a sponsor, which was Deutsche Bank. Um, and Deutsche Bank picked him up. And he now works uh, for Deutsche Bank, Columbus Circle, right in, right in Manhattan. And um, MIT just gave him a five-year option. So, um, good new brother. Yeah. That's and, amazing. Yeah. And he's 6'6", so <laughs> um, there's no question about whether or not he's adopted or not. <laughs> <laughs> How has he responded to you being gay and in the fetish scene and all of that? You know, I can tell you, man, I never, I never thought. I would be this lucky, doing what I do, mm -hmm. and being a part of the community that I'm a part of. I would be able to be blessed with something like that because it, it does change you. Sure, it's um, love that kid. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just really been amazing to have him in my life. You know, cool. Yeah, and um, I couldn't be more grateful. Really, you're in the public eye. You're, you're very well known, not just here in Fort Lauderdale, but I think around the country, a lot of people know who you are. You said you'd rather be infamous than be famous. Oh, yeah. It's true. What's, what's going on? Well, all right. So, first off, when you do what I do, um, there's a very seedy side to it, right? Sure. Uh, um, and, you know, being gayness um, is <laughs> a very strict thing. People are expecting you to do the right thing and to say the right thing and, and do that and, you know, follow all these rules when, you know, yeah. me, I, fuck, I can do anything. <laughs> you know, what did Chad Bush do? Oh my God, that's right. You know, so it's a lot different if you're not, if you're infamous. Yes. You know, because they don't have to follow the norms of what being game essentially is. Okay. Well, <laughs> well what, how do you see the norms? What does that mean? Well, um, you know, uh, I saw Chad Bush in a bathhouse. Oh, <laughs> really? God. Which, honestly, I can't do anyway because I can't have an anonymous sex because I walk in and I'm like, Chad! Yeah. Right, so, <laughs> yeah. right, I can't do that. I throw parties there. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But, I mean, I, you know, it's hard for me to have an anonymous sex, especially this time. So, <laughs> and, I, and because of my husband. Right? So, um, and, uh, so, yeah, it's, it's, it's easier. And people say, oh, my God, Chad did this. Sure he did. You know, people say, bullshit about me online, or they, you know, they, all this, oh, good, more, more hits. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. it's good, yeah. <laughs> What's the biggest misconception about you? Really? Um, well, <laughs> that I'm, uh, my biggest misconception, well, <laughs> I have a husband who I love, mm -hmm. and, uh, and I have not slept with anybody but my husband five years, and um, people think, oh, it's Chad Bush, I can just go up and grab his dick and then, of course, you know, feel free, but I haven't had sex with anybody but my husband in a very long time, and he has been the light of my life, and I'm just so lucky to have found him, and he's sitting right there, <laughs> and he has been, I love him, thank you. Chad Bush, thank you for an amazing interview <laughs> for Inside Leather History of Fireside Chats.